Hi everyone, uh, so as I introduce myself, I'm Mike Brudno and uh, I'm going to give you uh, sort of a, an introductory lecture about generally genetic disorders and uh, as Anne pointed out here, we'll talk more about germline disorders rather than cancer disorders or cancer predisposition disorders, even though many of the same ideas that you're going to learn can certainly be used in cancer predisposition syndromes uh, like uh, Lefermany. Uh, and so the way I've organized this, so I have a few introductory slides um, about genetic disorders in general. This is, you know, for those of you who are doing genetics, this should be like, you know, the level of introduction to a first year genetics class. So, uh, you know, just to make sure that all the bioinformatics folks are caught up in terms of uh, what kind of things we're after. Uh, then we'll talk about phenotyping. And this is actually something that I think is new to generally the CBW series and that people are very interested in genotypes and how to analyze this big genomic data but there's not I think enough thought into how we actually phenotype the patient and how we find out what's actually wrong with the patient and we'll I will talk about some of the ontologies that are available for this and show a tool that we have developed and that you will end up using then uh, I'll talk about how we go and identify candidate variants for a genetic disease. So once we have phenotypes and a genome, how we can go and distill and identify a candidate variant for a rare disease. So in the sort of in sections three and four, I will really concentrate on rare genetic syndromes rather than common ones, uh, because it's a lot easier to do things with rare syndromes. Uh, common is, is a more complicated beast. And uh, in the final stage, we will actually, I will show you how to do match, genomic matchmaking. This is when uh, two clinicians who are in opposite sides of the globe happen upon a patient with the, same com with the same rare genetic disease, how they can identify the existence of these cases uh, across countries and continents. Uh, and in the lab that we will do, uh, it'll really be concentrated on portions two and then four, so in the lab for this uh, class, for this lecture in lab one, we will do, we will phenotype some patients. And then the lab, part of the lab for section module two, there will be about actually looking at the results of the matchmaking and seeing if you have diagno can diagnose some patients which we have given to you uh, to diagnose. So just very quickly about what I mean when I say genetic variants. So, uh, genetic variants could be signal, signal, nu single uh, nucleotide variants, indels, copy number variants, structural variants, uh, and these happen naturally in every single generation. So all of you have about 100 genetic variants that were not present in any of your parents. These are novel variants that you have created that happened in the generation of your zygotes and uh, that became you. Most of the variants, and then uh, there are additional variants which take place during your lifetime. Every single cell in your body has probably maybe one more variant than the cell from which it started out, came out with. So these variants, you know, are everywhere. And when we look at variants present in an individual, most are going to be benign. Most variants are, will have no visible effect on you. And if there is a visible effect, it may do things like change your hair color or you know, change the exact shape of specific facial feature and not really have any impact on your health. This is the huge, huge fraction of all variants. However, a small fraction will be disease causing. Uh, of the variants that are disease causing, some will be what we call under selection, which means that these kind of variants, evolution likes to reject them. You're less, if, if you have one of these variants, you're less likely to reproduce, hence, because of the genetic disorder that you have. So, as a result, when you are actually, you know, those variants will be less frequent in the population and they 
quickly die down, and we can use some evolutionary features in order to help identify them. Other variants, other genetic variants, are neutral. They can be disease-causing and neutral. And how can that be? Well, because neutral uh, talks about evolutionary pressure. So if you have a genetic variant that, for example, predisposes you to Alzheimer's, that's not going to be under evolutionary selection because you can have kids, you know, have a family, and then, and then you know, what happens really after you've reproduced is irrelevant as far as evolution is concerned. Right? So, um, uh, so the, you know, so these variants are, you know, can be n benign or disease-causing, and neutral is separate. So neutral is, it talks about evolution. And very few variants, very, very few variants will be advantageous to an individual or to a population. And if they're really, really advantageous, they undergo what's called a selective sweep, and they actually take over the whole population, and everybody will end up having a variant as such. So can somebody give me an example of a variant that sort of has, been, has a, occurred relatively recently or that we know about that was advantageous? That would what? Against the Black Death. Okay, so that that would be a good example. I do not know about that specific one. Uh, the one that sort of one of the best known ones is uh, lactose tolerance. Right. So that's a variant that happened not a few hundred years ago. That happened, uh, you know, a few thousands to you know maybe ten ten thousand years ago, and happened mostly in. Uh, in, in the European population, and that allowed people to cons keep consuming milk through their whole lifespan rather than just as kids. And obviously, that was very advantageous if you're living in northern climates where food during the winter is hard to get. And if you have a cow, you can stay fed during the course of a winter, which is why and that variant is gone to it's present in almost a huge fraction of Europeans and very small fraction of let's say people from of African descent. Because in Africa there was that variant may have happened, but there is no similar pressure. And lactose tolerance is something that has actually developed multiple times during human evolution. Multiple groups of humans have independently developed genetic mutations that led to uh, uh, to, to lactose tolerance. So that's that's a classic example of an advantageous mutation. Um, but those are very rare. And once you and once and if they're really advantageous, then very soon after they happen, everybody has it, because you know if you keep on having the evolutionary pressure, you know those people who have the mutation are more likely to reproduce. At least you know it used to be the case until we have medicine which gets in the way of evolution. Okay, genetic disease. And by the way. Throw questions out. You know, this is it's meant to be quite you know interactive. There's you know I'm trying not to make it too dry. Um, so diseases are caused by largely due to a patient's DNA. We call genetic, and people typically split it into rare genetic disease and common genetic disease. Obviously, it's a continuum, right? There are things which are ultra, ultra, ultra rare, more and more and more common, and then you get into things which are really common. So, you know, on the ultra, ultra rare side, there will be diseases which you've never heard of unless you watch Dr. House. And on the common side will be, you know, things like type 1 diabetes. It's pretty genetic, but, uh, or autism. Um, rare genetic diseases are typically caused by highly penetrant mutations. So what does highly penetrant mean? Ready? If you have mutation, it will manifest in the man. If you have... If you have a mutation, pretty much means you have the visible phenotype. You have that disease. Uh, and there is actually, there are a few people, there are exceptions to this. There is, you know, and there's actually studies what they, people sometimes call them superheroes. People who have a genetic mutation which should cause a highly visible phenotype, a severe disease, but who are perfectly happy and healthy. And uh, we've identified some of these, and people are looking at the, what happened. Why does why do 99% of the people who have this mutation have a severe disease, and this weird 1% does not? While common genetic diseases, 
they often have a, an environmental uh, component. So it's, uh, you know, it's not the case that if you have a specific mutation, you have the phenotype. At least that's what we understand based on things like twin concordance studies, where uh, identical twins who have theoretically identical genomes, although that's not completely true. There are lots of uh, mitotic differences. Uh, but they have very, very similar genomes. Actually have a 60% concordance rate on the, for the, having the disease. So not 100%, but 60. So we think that their environment has a big role to play. So rare disease versus common disease. When people talk about rare diseases, we think that's always or you know almost in parentheses because nothing is always in genetics or medicine or biology. Um, is caused by highly penetrant rare variants. So it's very unlikely that a rare disease would be caused by a common variant. Something is common, present in lots of individuals, then it's unlikely to cause a very rare condition. Just the math doesn't work. At the same time, common diseases, there is actually a few hypotheses what could be happening. Uh, it's Some people think and obviously it's a combination of the two, but the question is what's more predominant. Some people think that it's largely caused by a rare variance with variable penetr penetrance. So it's still a rare variant that causes some of these more common diseases, and actually many <coughs> rare variants that contribute to a common disease, but the penetrance could be variable. Some people have the variant, but don't, dis don't actually develop the disease. Other people have the variant and do develop the disease. Others think it's caused by aggregation and epistasis of common variants. So it's actually more common. So it's, when I talk about a rare variant, I typically think about definitely less than 1%, uh, mostly because our ascertainment isn't great, probably less than 0.1% if we actually knew exactly the frequency of every allele in the human population. We just don't know that. Our, our, our uh, analysis is imperfect. So people typically say if it's present in more than 1%, we throw it out. It's, it's a common variant. It's less than 1% we're interested. So for more common variant uh, diseases, that's not a way of that people approach this, because uh, we think that the, having a multitude of common variants is actually uh, something that can contribute to a disease. And if you think about more common diseases, there are um, many of them are sort of more of a quantitative phenotype. So if you think about you know, intelligence or you know, obsessive compulsiveness, you know, it's, it's actually something that you can think of as a quantitative trait. You, know, you can't say this person, yes, this person is obsessive compulsive and that person isn't obsessive compulsive. It's really a, a continuum where some people are just way on the, off the chart, left or right, whichever side of the distribution you want to think about. And that's what we call the clinical disease. But in reality, you're dealing with a distribution of uh, intelligence or uh, many other things. And quantitative phenotypes are often Gaussian distributed, uh, especially if there are enough loci which contribute to the phenotype. If, lo enough if enough genetic variants help to contribute to your phenotype, each one sort of, you can think of it, each genetic change pushes you a little bit further in one direction, a little bit further in the other direction. Then by mixing all of these together, you end up getting a Gaussian distribution by the central limit theorem, or a, a, slight, a variant on the central limit theorem. Right? Everybody see that? If you have slight, if 100 things each contribute a tiny amount, then you end up with things that are distributed around the mean, but then pushed off to one side or another. So for traits like height, we think that actually hundreds of genes are contributing and hundreds of genetic loci are actually impacting things like your height, which is why uh, a very good predictor of height is your mid-parental height. You take the average height of your parents, and that's a good predictor of your height. Modulo the fact that every single generation is a little bit taller than the previous ones due to uh, improved, uh, due to improved uh, food and things like that, right? Make sense? All right, so looking for cause of genetic disease. Uh, for common disease, we basically use something, uh, you know, I, I call it GWAS. People who work on some of these approaches yell at me when I say this because 
it's not G, they say it's not GWAS, it's sort of, it's a much more robust method. But if you think about what GWAS stands for, it's Genome Wide Association Study. That's really what they're doing. They're doing an association study between a variant and a phenotype, and they're doing it on a genome-wide basis. So if you do it in a very straightforward way, you look at variant and say, is that correlated with a phenotype? Variant, is that correlated with a phenotype? Variant, is that correlated with a phenotype? Uh, it's easy test to do, but you get into the problem of multiple testing correction. So if you do, if you have a million variants, that's 10 to the 6 tests that you have to do. That means your p-values be, better be 10 to the minus 8 before you're considered significant, which basically means you have to do a lot of, you have to have a lot of patients before you can actually identify any kind of biases. And once you start looking for multiple things which are acting together, it's basically forget it. You're, you know, you're, you, you, you will never have, there aren't enough humans in the world to power an association study. So people start doing tricks. They look at aggregation of variants across a gene. They look at uh, uh, pre-filtering based on function. They look at aggregation, uh, at uh, uh, looking at networks, gene networks, to identify which genes may be working together in order to help improve the statistical power. One thing that's important to remember about GWAS is that it identifies correlation, not causation. So if you see a paper which says, oh, we have a variant that is linked to a specific uh, genetic disease, that doesn't mean that variant causes that disease. It means that variant is correlated with the disease. The actual causative variant may be a different variant which is sitting somewhere not too far away, just due to linkage disequilibrium, or it could be you know, so it, in some other way linked, but not necessarily causative. And for rare disease, it's actually simpler. We're looking for one or two, typically. You know, one if it's a you know homozygous variant, or if it's a, or if it's a, something like if it's a dominant disease, or two if it's a compound heterozygous uh, recessive disease variants that are responsible for the disease. The problem here is that there are, you know, you, the problem is that there's really no, nothing statistical about this anymore. You have usually too few patients in order to power an association study. You really are looking for a specific variant and saying, could that variant have caused this disease? And how do you narrow down the search from several million variants in a whole single genome uh, to a smaller number? Well, if you have a multiple, if you have a large family, and you have a pedigree, you can do linkage. You can see what are the common portions of the genome amongst all of the members of the family. So uh, you can also do functional, uh, you can do, uh, you can do uh, things like uh, identifying, uh, looking at variants which are assumed to have a functional role and filtering based on that. Or, um, you know, at the end of the day, once you have a candidate variant or a couple of candidate variants, you actually need to somehow prove it. And to prove it, you need to either put it into a model organism and run functional studies which show that you can recapitulate the phenotype in a tissue or a mouse or a fly or whatever is the, your model organism of choice, <laughs> or identify other such patients with this disease. And the key thing here is unrelated patients with the disease. Because if they are related, could just be that they share the variant due to their heritage, due to the fact that they come from the same, uh, come from, from a recent common ancestor. So, right, because, you know, if you have, if you're, if you're uh, somebody's, uh, if, you're, if you have a share a grandparent, that means, you know, about 20 variants have happened just in your grandparent and you, both of you have inherited. So that's, uh, there's a good chance that that happens by chance. All right, so that's you know brief overview of genetic diseases. Next thing I want to talk about is phenotyping, and how and that's talking about you know when you have a genetic disease, the patient has something. You know sometimes when you're working with cancer, it's sort of okay. Here's a thousand patients, and all of them have uh, glioblastoma, and it's sort of the phenotype is obvious because you've selected your patient group based on the phenotype. Uh, but in reality, even within those patients, you will have different outcomes, different reactions to drugs, different um, uh, survival rates, and different comorbidities. 
right, which could have contributed to the survival rates, which you may or may not have information about. You may just know the patient had glioblastoma, here is their sample. You probably will have a couple other things like age. So you would think that, okay, we have electronic health records for many of these patients. Can we just get that electronic health record data and make use of it? Turns out, not so easy, because this is what the modern electronic health record looks like. Uh, even places like which have EPIC and the other great electronic health record systems, really, it's their electronic health records are meant for collecting data, not for using the data that has been collected. So it's I, I, I consider it like a broom closet. Like if you have a very you know a, a closet with lots and lots of you know things in it, if you know exactly what you put in and you know where you put it, you can go in and find it. But if you have such a closet and you say you want to say how many records in that closet have X? Okay, you know I work at the sick kids hospital across the street. You know, how many kids with microcephaly, which is like small heads, have we seen at the hospital? in the last year. There's absolutely no way for anybody to run such a query. So it just does not exist. Because, you know, first of all, so for, sm for small heads, it's kind of a bit easier because some people measure the heads. And so we do have that number somewhere, uh, even though the number could be in different places, but that's our issue. But even when you, but when you get into something like, okay, instead of small heads, let's take, you know, specific facial abnormality, cleft palate. How many kids with cleft palate? Well, other, somebody will say cleft lip, other will say cleft palate, other will say compound cleft because it may be both up and down. So there will be very different words and searching across, you know, even if you had the search capability, you would not be able to do a textual search that would identify all such cases. And this is really what an HR should be, and this is, you know, my sort of my goal is to sort of prevent into to explaining what I would like an HR to look like. And that's something that can help navigate tests, genome, and phenotypes, sort of to complete this triangle, to go back and forth. Identify phenotypes, what the patient has, what's in their genome, decide this is the test I need to run that contributes a new phenotype, or maybe identify something new about the genetic variants that are present, and then you continue around the triangle. So when I talk about phenotyping here, what I mean is deep phenotyping. And you know, so what, what's deep phenotyping? Instead of saying patient has disease X, I want you to give me all the features of the disease. Our goal is to actually identify what the disease is, because in rare diseases, identifying a diagnosis is difficult. There are also many very similar diseases. So actually specifying all of the common, all of the features is important for saying it's disease A versus disease B and to obviously keeping track of genotype, phenotype associations. How do people phenotype their patients? And this is uh, what happens in most places today. So people do either free text or check boxes. So this is the option of free text. And if somebody, if a patient has dysmorphic features or dysmorphic face, which is basically say abnormal facial shape, this is what you may find in the medical record. DF, dysmorphic, dysmorphic faces, dysmorphic features. And so there's multiple ways of saying the exact same thing. It gets a little bit more worse. Uh, for congenital malformation or congenital anomaly, those two are the same things. These are all of the things we've taken out of the records of the diagnostic lab at SickKids. These are all the exact same things. They include abbreviations. So Kong M or Kong Mal4 or congenital M. It includes interesting spellings like anomaly, anomaly, and 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 anam, anomaly. Um, it includes abnormal or abnormalities. It includes basically many, many ways of saying the exact same thing, which are all totally incomprehensible to a computer and not accessible to bioinformatics methods. And so this is an example of list. This is actually a patient description from the diagnostic lab. DD Kong will four be half pro. And as a human, you can say, oh, that actually makes some sense. DD is developmental delay, congenital malformations, or behavioral problems. But for a computer, that's not interpretable. Or DD, DFMR, which is developmental delay, uh, dysmorphic face, and mental retardation, which is actually pretty, not exactly the same as developmental delay, but similar. 
The alternative is you do check boxes and you have these forms where you can check off what are the relevant phenotypes for the patient. The problem is that they has a limited granularity and as soon as you want to specify something more granular, you just have to use the other box and then you go back to the same problem of entering free text. So many problems uh, with the status quo. Uh, if you have free text, it's very difficult to interpret for a computer. Uh, you may see in the doctor's note something like, first words at five years. That makes a lot of sense to a human. The patient has language delay. But that means nothing to a computer. And good luck identifying all of the patients with language delay. Somebody will say first words at five years. Others will say language delay. Others will say something else. And um, has trouble spelling could indicate dyslexia. Or recognizes only close relatives could indicate dementia. But obviously, these are expressed in human terms, not computer understandable terms. We also have the problem of multiple terms having the exact same meanings. And as a result, it's difficult to do computation with phenotypes. And in order to do computation with phenotypes, what you need are really medical ontologies. And ontology, yeah? Can you define ontology? Will I define an ontology? Yeah. Yes. So, um, uh, and do I have a slide on that? Uh, I will define it. I may have a slide on it later. So ontology is really a conceptualization of uh, of of uh, meaning of uh, of knowledge, where there we have the concept, we have concepts, and then we have synonyms for those concepts, so that multiple synonyms can move the, map to the same concept, but also the same textual description can actually map to multiple concepts, and in which case you have to specify which concept you're talking about, as opposed to which which uh, textual string. And these concepts are also organized in a way that uh, shows how they relate to each other. So I will show you an example, and hopefully that will demonstrate. Um, so why? So this is what an ontology is. So if I say a word, football, it may mean something very different to you than it does to me. So you know, an example. So when I said it, you may think about this, uh, and um, and but in reality, I was actually thinking about that. So, and you think, okay, well, it's two footballs, American football, you know, soccer, European football, you know, can't we just call it, you know, you know, have this ambiguated? Actually, it becomes more complicated because others of you may have thought about this. And uh, as you, I don't need to explain to the, this audience probably the difference between those two, yeah? American football versus Canadian football. Um, uh, but others uh, may have thought about this. Uh, does anybody know what that is? Football? What? Gaelic football. Gaelic football. So this is Irish. Irish play a game that's uh, played. It's sort of similar to rugby, but it's played with a spherical ball, uh, and um, uh, you can score both inside the net and above the net. And it's 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 pretty rough. Uh, only the Irish player. Uh, and uh, then you know you may, but also could have thought about that. Anybody know what this is? Australian. Australian football, Aussie rules football. So, uh, yeah, and you always say, okay, fine, it's just us humans misusing the same word. But the same thing uh, can be true as, uh, in medicine. So there's muscle fibrillation versus ventricular fibrillation. People may just use the term fibrillation without specifying which one they mean, which requires this disambiguation into the underlying concepts. So what are ontologies? Ontologies are terms with relationships. So if I were to build a sports ontology, we could have something like sports, ball sports, football-related sports, North American football, under which you may have American football and Canadian football, association football, or soccer, as it's known uh, in this continent, and then maybe rugby derivatives, which would include union and Aussie rules football and Gaelic football, which actually shows that you know, something like rugby union is more closely related to Aussie rules football than is association football, even though two of them have the word football in the name, but the third one does not. So this allows us to start doing logic on these, uh, on these terms. <coughs> the same thing can be true in medicine. There is an ontology that we love, which is called the human phenotype ontology, and it has 11,000 medical phenotypic terms. So these are 
phenotypes. They're not all kinds of medical terms. I think I may have a slide later about uh, ontologies in general, like other kinds of medical ontologies. But uh, the problem with medical ontologies is there's so many things that can be wrong with a, an individual. So what we want to do is really limit it to uh, phenotypes that can be present in a genetic disease. And these are structured. So a coloboma, which is a specific abnormal eye morphology, is under abnormal eye morphology, under eye disease. And neurologic diseases are their own separate category. And skeletal are their own separate category. So um, it's, it's a humongous effort. Yeah? How is it related to the MESH term? Uh, it's part of MESH, but uh, MESH is more for literature. This is HPO is more used for clinical, uh, for clinical workloads. And how does it does not, unfortunately. So uh, unfortunately, it does not relate to ICD. ICD is a billing or billing code. So there are lots of medical ontologies, which is why you know we use the HPO, but they are not. Um, uh, they but they're not. Uh, but they don't relate to every other medical ontology. We can, there's a long list, and I can t talk for a while about the advantages and disadvantages of each one of them. What about in today's hospital? So in a hospital, uh, some people use ICD are billing codes. They're basically, I saw the patient for this problem, and that's what I'm billing for. But if a patient came in with a broken leg, but they also have Down syndrome, you're not going to report the Down syndrome because they came in for the broken leg. So they're usually about billings, not phenotypes that are present in the patient. SNOMED is better for phenotypes, but SNOMED has its own issues because it's too big and is not sort of super refined in terms of genetic abnormalities. So there's, uh, there's multiple that are in use and none are great. The good thing about HPO is in addition to this sort of uh, granularity, we have what, sorry? Granularity. Granularity? Granularity means basically uh, how specific. So if you look at this hierarchy, you could say that a patient has an atrial septal defect. You could also say that the patient has abnormality of the atrial septum, they can, which is, you know, but you can say they have a cardiac malformation or a cardiac. Uh, anomaly, cardiac abnormality. So that's the granularity of the phenotype. So you may report, oh, the patient has heart disease. but Or you can get very specific about what is the exact problem with the heart. So that's what I mean by granularity. So how, high, how, high how high up the ontology we go? And um, so, and they are linked to OMIM, which are the common genetic diseases. So each phenotype, there are links which say, oh, that's related to this one, or this one's related to this one. And this, uh, you know what, I'll just skip this. Have, uh, multiple HPOs that map to OMIM. Yes. Terms. Each OMIM disease will have many HPO terms which map to it. So, yeah. Is HPO an international standard or is it a local one? Uh, HPO is uh, pretty well, it, it's not, it's the official ontology of ERDIC, the International Rare Disease Research Consortium. It's developed by an international group. It's, it's pretty much a lingua franca of rare, rare disease research at this point. Uh, it's, the, it's the main thing that's used in rare disease. It's not something that we developed. We, we, we've contributed to it, but we have not developed it. So, you know, we have built a system to make it easy for clinicians to enter HPO terms. Uh, so the key thing is that ontologies are large. So remember the check boxes I showed? Imagine giving a clinician 11,000 check boxes to check off yes or no to. They'll, you know, they will probably, you know, they will either never finish or they will laugh at you. I'm not sure which is more likely, depends on the person. And it really want to make it easy to do and make it so that they can do it during the patient visit. So, you know, the goal of our work was to make deep phenotyping simple and to make it faster than doing it on paper. So I'm going to very quickly show you um, phenotypes, and you will have a chance to play with it in the lab. So I'm going to, I'm going to go to this version of it, although you will, you'll be using a different one. When you go in, you can create a new patient. And for a patient, you can specify their name. And you know, for example, date of birth. Scrolls reversed. So you can do things like draw the family tree, draw the pedigree. 
So there is Jim. There are Jim's parents. You can click here, and that will give you Jim's grand paternal grandparents and maybe maternal grandparents. And maybe, you know, Jim's mom has a new partner. And this is now a separated union. So you can indicate such things. Uh, Jim may have a sister. And uh, there's the sister. Uh, so for those who are not familiar, squares are men, circles are women. And for every single node, there's these handlebars which add children, partners, siblings, or parents. You can also drag each node to another person. So for example, if you wanted to indicate that, for example, uh, this is actually a consanguineous union and these two people are actually siblings, what you could do is say, take this bar and drag it to here. And that indicates that these two are actually siblings and this is a consanguineous union between cousins. Something that's actually quite common in genetic disease, uh, that you're seeing consanguineous families. So once you save it, you can actually do, you know, so there are many other sections which you can explore on your own. The key things that you will need to know are how to enter clinical symptoms. So there's actually an area where you can just do quick phenotype search. And if your patient has something like a small head, you can just type that. And it'll say, oh, well, small head, you really should have said microcephaly. So you can actually, and you can click on that, and that will tell you the patient has microcephaly. And it'll tell you how good your description is, how, how, how informative. Uh, you can also do things like, let's say you wanted, uh, I don't know, heart defect. And I'll say, uh, well, there's kind of truncal defect, which is a specific heart defect. There's abnormal heart morphology, which is very general. Well, there's this eye button, which can, you know, <laughs> if you're looking for something more detailed, you can click on eye. And then it gives you a whole bunch of synonyms for this term and allows you to click browse related term, which will actually give you a whole bunch more detail about other types of abnormal heart morphology that may be present. And you can go into each one of them and, for example, zoom in or zoom in further and then select the specific defect that you had in mind. So it allows you to browse the whole hierarchy right inside this, uh, right inside the system. And then you can select, yeah, that's the one I meant. Once you have selected a number of terms, a few things happen. One is the, sorry, I keep on scrolling the wrong way. You get the ability to get, to look at the diagnosis. So given the phenotypes, it actually does the search for what are the matching genetic disorders so that you can see what matches. Like, uh, I clicked a few random things. So here's something that, and then you can see what is actually associated with that specific disorder. Uh, you can also see a uh, gene panel. So you can see here are the genes that are, uh, which are mutations and which are known to cause the following phenotypes. And you can actually click on any one of these to recompute without that one. So here's a panel without that phenotype. So this gives you the ability to very quickly enter all the phenotypes of your patient. I was just wondering how, um, are you Uh, so there's a way to re-index it inside the system. We, have, we do not have a direct connection to OMIM. Okay, so then it's how often are you doing uh, uh, So it's, everybody has their own instance. It's up to them to keep it updated. Oh, okay. So when you install it, there is a way, you know, we basically, you know, the thing we ship with it is we update every few. You know, whenever we have a new release of phenotypes, we download the latest version of OMIM and include it. So I can add to that. And, and where do you people store this? Because you're entering, entering personally yeah. identifiable information, right? So, so uh, the so usually people have it on their own computers within their within their hospital. There is one public version of phenotypes called Phenome Central, which I'll talk about next. But that one does not allow for the PHI descriptors. So most people will download their own license and then have it on their own. Computer. Yeah, you, I mean it's open source. If as long as you're doing it on your own computer, you can download it and use it. The, 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 the license, the, you know, if you want it for your hospital, then there is a bit more, you know, to talk about. But if you're just using it for personal use, there's, you can just download it, install it, and run it. So um, it has the ability to uh, retranslate OMIM in, in ontology that actually maps to this um, as searchable? Well, so that's, or? that's done, but not by us. The OMIM, HPO and OMIM are already linked. 
okay. So that's uh, we just use the links. Is this an HPO based or is this so is this a third is this a different platform? No, it's HPO. So all of the terms. So when you do the search here for you know CHD and it shows abnormal heart morphology, if you click up, sorry, I'm having trouble with the navigation. Uh, okay, take. <coughs> click on the I button. It'll show human phenotype ontology, the HP term, and you can click on this, and it will actually take you to HPO. Cool. But yeah. And so does it have the ability? I mean, how searchable and, and modular is it? Can you, like, for example, if you want to find all patients with an FBX mutation who had, you know, microcephaly in both the son and father? Can they search the, the pedigrees as well? Uh, not the pedigrees. It can do the search of the patients. The pedigrees, you'd have to script yourself. But there are RESTful APIs for pretty much everything. So you'd have to, you can write your own code. And there are Excel ex exports as well. Because the, that GUI that you're saying, there's a script behind it. Sorry? The, for the pedigrees, there's a script behind it that you could. Oh, yeah, everything goes, and there's a data model behind it, and there are RESTful APIs which you can use instead of the nice UI. I like the UI, but yeah, yeah but uh, but uh, but you can actually write code to work with phenotypes. We won't do that here, but so um, the next part I want to talk about is how do we identify actually a causative variant? And this will be pretty quick. So when you sequence a patient's genome, you're going to have if you're looking for a cause of a rare disease, you're looking at millions of variants. You can sort of use different tricks in order to narrow them down to a re relatively small number. So you can look at things like filtering for common variants. If a variant is present in more than 1% of the common population, throw it out. Uh, you know, we also look typically for non-synonymous or stop gains or splicing variants, variants which are thought to have a larger impact, and throw out things like synonymous variants. <laughs> Although that's not the right thing to do. Synonymous variants have been known to cause disease. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of really the right thing to do is to prioritize them lower, but still look at them. But in practice, people often throw them out. And once they have done that, they actually often look at the variants and they try to, for the non-synonymous variants, look at their functional prediction, like what could the function be? And for this, they look at things like protein structure. Where within the protein does the mutation lie? Is it likely to actually change a functional unit of the protein? They look at things like amino acid chemistry. Uh, so the, what is the actual chemistry of the amino acid that's changed? Does it change from hydrophobic to hydrophilic? And as a result, could change the structure and things like that. And they often look at homology. So they look at others related proteins and see, is that site variable? So, this is encapsulated in lots of tools like Polyfan, SIFT, uh, you know, mutation taster, and so on. Almost all of these tools are heavily biased but to the homology. They're very much driven by the conservation of the site. And this is important to remember. If you're looking at the cause of a rare disease that actually doesn't manifest until late in life, or that's a pharmacogenetic disease, for example, as something that only manifests when in combination with a specific <coughs> medication, those are not likely to be under selection. So looking at selection is really not necessarily the right thing. And if you're looking for a rare disease that onsets at the age of 50, polyphen filters are not going to do necessarily a good job. You should be very careful with that. One of the things that we've noticed is that there's, in a good number of cases, there's discrepancy between yeah, all of these tools are imperfect. Nobody uses like if you're if you're looking for a clinical diagnosis, that's not proof. Just because all these tools even agree, but yes, the tools often disagree, and usually people say, "Well, if two out of three do it, I'm, I'll put it on my list of things to look at." It's 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 a guide, not a, a hard filter. All of these tools. So things that can be a guide, you know, find when you identify a mutation. Seeing other affected individuals within the family, you know, could help make you more confident that this actually is the mutation that you're uh, looking for. So, you know, when people often do, they do exome or whole genome of one patient, and when they find the mutation they think they're interested in, they will just Sanger just that specific location in the parents to see what's the inheritance pattern. Is it novel? Is it, you know, or sometimes people just, since sequencing is cheaper now, people just do whole trios off the bat and look for de novo so that they can see de novo mutations right away. And obviously, the final proof that you would like is uh, having multiple families, all of them having the same 
mutations in the same gene at least and uh, same phenotypes. That's what sort of the clinical genetics community holds as proof that you have identified a variant that or gene that's related to a disorder. So one thing I want to throw into this, there are genome interpretation tools which actually look at the phenotypes. So um, the most uh, popular of the, these, or one of the most commonly used of these, is called Examizer. And what happens there is they look for not just the harmfulness of variants, which is you know what is computed by tools like Polyphen and SIFT, uh, so just use the mouse, and whatnot. But they look at the built for every gene a phenotypic relevance score. And the way they do this is based on model, exper model organism experiments. So for example, if they knock out a specific gene in the mouse and the mouse has a small skull, they say, oh, a small skull is sort of like a small head in a human. So we can sort of try to understand, that, well, maybe the mutations in the same gene will cause also a small head. Or, for example, you know, let's say they, when you knock out a specific gene in a mouse, it causes some kind of brain abnormalities. Well, that probably would correlate to abnormal neural, uh, abnormal neural function. So that could correlate with a gene in humans that causes seizures or developmental delay or other kind of neurological abnormality. And for this, we can use the ontology, right? Because the ontology doesn't give you the relationship between the phenotypic terms. You can say, oh, you know, brain abnormalities are very similar to, or you know, structural brain abnormalities are neurologic abnormalities as are seizures and as is developmental delay. So these are all problems of the brain. So the, what they do is they take the phenotypic profile of the individual, of the patient, map it to, mal, to m m m mouse ontology, mouse phenotype ontology, there is an equivalent mouse part, and look for what genes have been known to associate with those mouse phenotypes in the mouse knockout studies. So they do extensive mouse knockout studies. And, so, and it turns out that if you look at a random patient, like patients who walk in the clinic, genetics clinic door, and you sequence every single one of them, automated tools will help identif cause, identify the cause of mutation in about 50% of the cases. So you don't really have to have much involvement. It's the other 50% though that are the difficult ones. So finally, yep. Do you usually have a problem with the fact that these are rare diseases? So then they may be occurring in extremely rare genes, which haven't really had any functional studies in neuron models. That's true. So, you know, there is not every single gene has been studied in the mouse, so there are, you know, extensive knockout studies for lots of, you know, that, at this point, but we do know of cases when, you know, when you know, you look in the mouse phenotype, there's, there's usually something there, but it could be, you know, there's full knockouts or embryonic lethals, and what we really need are specific mutations introduced, and it, it becomes, you know, then you have to go and look at the specific mutation you have and see if you can recapitulate it in the mouse with you know, CRISPR or whatnot. So, the last thing I want to talk about is matchmaking. So how do we identify all of these extra families? Uh, and with rare diseases, uh, there is a lot of very rare diseases. So people are thinking about, people throw out numbers anywhere between 7,000 and 14,000 rare diseases out there in the world. Uh, there's a lot of them which have very, very few patients. Actually, but altogether, rare diseases are pretty common. We think that the total prevalence of rare diseases is about 5%, that every single about 5% of the people will develop some kind of a rare disease over their lifetime. I'm not sure if that's, it's that high, but you know, that's the number of people throw out. And when a patient sees a patient, some, uh, when a clinician sees a patient with a rare disease, they might not recognize a known disease just because they don't have experience with it, or they have only it's the first patient where whom they've identified a new gene, and they want to find others who have the exact same gene. And the key is to share the data. All the clinicians have to be able to put their data together in order to um, to to have uh, to make conclusions. And to tackle this, there's an ambitious international effort uh, called the Matchmaker Exchange, which is uh, meant to tackle this uh, challenge. And the idea is that when there's one clinician who puts in their case into some database, uh, another clinician may put their case into a different database. Really, the databases should talk to each other in order to help clinicians identify the match, let them know, you know, the two of you have the same kind of patient and let them, 
talk to each other then to really confirm that this is the right match. And the matchmaker exchange has multiple members. So these are all the members from around the world. And I will talk more about Phenome Central, which is the team group right here, which is the tool that we have developed for this. And that's the one that you will use in your lab. So it's a portal to, for sharing of phenotype and genotype data. And uh, you, know, there's a, you, you will all play with it, not with the main one. You will set up, we set up a separate one for this course, uh, which lets you connect with other clinicians. The idea is that you phenotype your patients, and this will be done using the phenotypes interface that you already saw. Uh, once the patient is phenotyped, you can add a uh, VCF file corresponding to the patient's exome or genome, and as you will do, and decide how you want to share it. Is it just for you? Is it something you want to make public? Or is it something that you want to make share uh, uh, matchable? Which means that it should be, it will be matched when there is new similar cases that appear. And then the, under the hood, what the system will do is we'll find similar patients for you. It will identify them based on phenotypic similarity using the HPO. So when you have patients, you can identify what's really common using the HPO and uh, compute a score for this. And similarly, it can take the genetic data and help you identify patients that are similar genetically by running Examizer to prioritize all of the genetic variants in each patient and figuring out what's really common. What are the genes that are common for the two uh, patients? Let's skip this. At the end, you can see the patients that are similar to your patient. And you'll see a view that looks a little bit like this, where you can see all of your features, but you don't really know what the other patient has. You have just very general terms. And you can, then uh, you can see some of the genetic similarities. <clears throat> you can contact the other submitter and then you will be able to see the full amount of similarity between your case and the other case. So that's the end of the lecture. So yeah, questions first. Who has, uh, they, who's been actually entering all the phenotype data from these centers? I mean, do they have like dedicated staff to do that? Or uh, the, clinicians, the clinicians won't have time to do something like that. I'm just well, thinking about how you could translate it into the cancer realm. Uh, so I don't know how you can cancer. So cancer realm is some, not something I work nearly as much on. But in, in uh, for genetics, uh, it's often the genetic counselor, which is sort of like the the nurse of the genetics world, who are responsible for interacting with the patients. Also, genetics visits are much longer than regular, you know, clinic visits. You know, a, a, a geneticist may spend two hours with their patient. Uh, you know, so it's, it really is a, it's a bit of a different uh, game there. And a lot of these cases are research cases where they're, you know, they're being studied for research purposes, and then it's not a huge overhead. Entering, if you have, as you will find out, entering the data for a single patient takes a few minutes if you actually are, um, uh, if, you're, if, if, you're, if you know what the patient has. A lot of the time is actually spent reviewing the notes. What we will do is we will give you summarized notes for patients, and you will see that you can enter all of the data pretty quickly. Yeah? How does this intersect with patient confidentiality, or how do you deal with that? So the, for, you know, for the broader matchmaking, there is no identifiable data that goes in. It's the, it's the clinicians who are communicating. The patients do not communicate directly. And that has been one of the, like their patients have wanted to get involved, uh, but we've had issues in terms of how we bridge this clinician world and the patient world. And it's almost like you want two matchmaker exchanges, one for the patients and one for the clinicians. Good patients have to consent. So uh, it's actually interesting. For research, yes. But uh, we've also said that this is something that should be part of standard, uh, standard of care. So in which case, if you're consenting to your care for care, you automatically consent to very uh, rough data about you being shared uh, through systems like this. So it, it, it's, uh, if, you're doing, if, if it's a research patient, then yes, they need to consent explicitly. If it's a clinic patient, then uh, if, it, if it's a clinic, then you actually need less consent. And this, this was a decision that, you know, we r ran up with the appropriate ethics and policy people. And at Sick Kids, we've actually, uh, different places have done different things as far as REB is. At Sick Kids, we've gone, taken Phenome Central through the Sick Kids REB, and they have, they've signed off. Mm -hmm.